It has been just over four months since the Taliban seized Kabul and American troops pulled out of Afghanistan. The WHO estimates one million Afghan children under the age of five will die of starvation this winter. When Kabul fell, the elected president, Ashraf Ghani, fled along with his closest aides, including his national security advisor, Hamdullah Mohib. Mohib is with us now for his first interview. It's good to have you here. Thank you. Why are you in Washington? Well, I'm here to see people, friends and colleagues, former colleagues, uh, to talk about what happened and what to do next and how to help our people. You are looking for a role in Afghanistan? No. What are you trying to do to help? Well, like you said, people are still starving. Uh, our responsibility to the Afghan people has not ended. Uh, it's, uh, we're not no longer uh, the Republic, the Islamic Republic that served the people. Uh, but uh, I feel like we still owe it to the Afghan people to make sure uh, that this suffering uh, ends. There's a lot to get to uh, with you, um, but let's start on what happened. Um, the war was a strategic failure for the United States. The withdrawal was chaotic, it was deadly, it was a political crisis for this president. President Biden puts the blame, though, squarely on your government. Do you accept any of that blame? Look, there is enough blame to go around. Um, obviously, the Afghan government uh, and the people responsible for running the Afghan government are, um, are responsible. Uh, but so are our partners in the international community, uh, and we all have uh, blame to share. When you say those running the government, you mean President Ghani, who you served, and yourself? Myself included, absolutely, yes. We all have blame to share. Um, I think uh, it's important to see why and where it started. You know, there, are, there is a lot of focus on one day, uh, on what happened in one day, uh, instead of broadening and saying what led to the decisions that were made that day. Uh, and, and why we had, to be, we had to choose to make those decisions. And why were those decisions so narrow? I mean, why, what, what happened and what led to it? Uh, and I would like to talk about that. I want to talk about that day yes. when you left Kabul and the broader issue. But I want to address something that the president of this country told the American people when he was speaking about Afghanistan. Listen. Afghanistan political leaders gave up and fled the country. The Afghan military collapsed, sometime without trying to fight. We gave them every tool they could need. We provided close air support. We gave them every chance to determine their own future. What we could not provide them was the will to fight for that future. What do you make of that assessment? Did you lack the will? Absolutely not. The Afghan people made tremendous sacrifices for Afghanistan. I think uh, uh, it's, it would be dishonor to uh, take that away. Uh, what happened was the rug was pulled under the Afghan's uh, feet. Uh, the decision uh, to talk directly and engage the Taliban um, and make a deal with the Taliban that didn't include the Afghan government was protested myself in this city uh, about what was going to happen to our government, what was going to happen to us. That was the a US agreement under the Trump administration with the Taliban exactly. that the Biden administration honored. And, and those decisions, that decision to talk directly to the Taliban without uh, the, the presence of the Afghan government and, and then the full transparency with the Afghan government led to the collapse that happened on, uh, on, on August 15th. Um, for three years, our hands were tied behind our back. We were not allowed to fight. There was no offensive. In 2018 and uh, 2019, the Trump administration's uh, policy that was the South Asia strategy was doing wonders. It was helping us push the Taliban back. In 2019, there was a whole offensive planned to push the Taliban, uh, and uh, it, it would have given us a part to not a total military victory, but given us close to getting what we wanted. But the Taliban and then was the, gaining control and then the support of parts was, of the country. No, they 2019, were 
2019, we started taking the, pushing uh, uh, Daesh out of uh, the east, eastern Nangarhar. There was no fighting uh, in, in Kunar. We, in, the, in the north, the offensives were planned. And then, and then that's when the support stopped. So we stopped receiving the kind of support that was necessary to be able to continue those offensive operations. In 2020, when this deal was signed, there was no offensive on the part of the Afghan government. We were told, if you announce an offensive against the Taliban, you would be seen as warmongers. And the Taliban continued to strike the Afghan security forces throughout the country. They had an agreement to say there will be no attacks on city centers and district centers, but all of the outposts around the city and district centers that were protecting it were being targeted, and our hands were tied. We were not, we we're not able to uh, uh, to announce a, 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 an offensive that year. In 2022, 2021, all they had was district centers left. So from 2019, the collapse of the Afghan government started. Uh, in 2020. It, 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 they, it gained momentum in 2021. It was the end. They were at city centers fighting. Uh, I think uh, uh, the Afghan security forces fought bravely uh, and defended what they could. But when, uh, when there was no more, when nothing was left, um, including the supplies of their ammunition, we ran out of all kinds of ammo for our um, air force. Uh, we didn't have any kind of laser-guided missiles anymore. Um, and, and so they were, uh, our aircrafts were grounded and we didn't have the close air support that we needed from the uh, international community, You're including about the now United under States. under the Biden administration. This That's is this year. Question. This is 2021. Mm -hmm. our, um, our, our fixed aircraft, the fixed wing aircrafts, didn't have the ammunition necessary to be able to, uh, to fight. So uh, I think, and when the contractors withdrew, or when the contractors were withdrawing from, uh, they they were doing everything for the Afghan, uh, from a logistical perspective, that there was still a huge amount of dependency. The Afghan security forces could fight, mm -hmm. but only when they had everything they needed. So what you are talking about is unpacking years of strategy bringing up to this point. I want to go to the day. You say there's too much focus on it, but I think we have to talk Absolutely. about it first. You were known as President Ghani's closest aide. Where is he now? He is in the UAE. Is it true that the Emirati government has told him and has told you that you can't be involved with politics any longer? No. In If we're living and we're hosted by the, um, uh, the government of the uh, United Arab Emirates, they don't want any political activity, and that's their, pos that's their rule. Yeah. So while we're there, we'd have to respect uh, their policy. Your last day in Afghanistan was on August the 15th. Um, that was the day that the Taliban seized control. They were already in the city. By the end of the day, they had seized control. Did you have any idea when you woke up that morning that you would be fleeing the country? No. When did in you? In fact, the, the, the night before, uh, my staff contacted me and asked if we would, if we should start shredding and burning uh, sensitive documents. And we, I didn't believe that it'd be so so soon. We still thought there's two more weeks, um, and the Taliban had at least two more weeks until the U.S. presence uh, in Kabul. And we uh, had received the day before a briefing from our chief of army staff. Uh, plus, um, he, he was accompanied by uh, Admiral Baisley uh, and um, you know, the, the Shah Day and, and the chief of station in Kabul. Um, and so they, you know, our chief of army staff said that he had fully coordinated with the Americans and that they will be able to defend Kabul, um, so much so that they were even plans to push back uh, uh, from Kabul against the territory that we have lost. Uh, and, but by this stage, we had several cities and provinces around Kabul that were still under Afghan uh, government's control. We had Nangarhar, we had Lagman, uh, we had Wardak. These are provinces that are around around Kabul. But by that morning, by 4 a.m. that morning, we had lost m all of those provinces, plus a key district in Kabul, Surubi, that was gone to the Taliban. And the night before, uh, the Taliban even tried to break into Pulicharhi prison, which is inside now, almost inside Kabul city, um, uh, but it was previously in, in the sub-district, one of the districts. So you woke up that morning knowing that the Taliban is essentially knocking on the door of the capital. Correct. When did you decide to flee? Well, uh, about 
p.m. Uh, Why? The decision by that stage, uh, I was supposed to leave to Doha um, to uh, to to be part of the negotiating team, uh, but. The news that came in at that point made me understand that we no longer have, no longer have a, a consolidated force. And based on the discussions I have had with the president before, that if the fight comes to Kabul and it's a, a fight that we have to do inside Kabul city's, city, mm -hmm. we would no longer do that fight. So just for, for those watching, in Doha, Qatar, there are negotiations happening led by the United States with the Taliban trying to have a peaceful transfer of power. That's where you were headed. That's where we were headed, yes. But then what changed? I, I heard from, first of all, all day long we were getting news and the situation was getting worse uh, because the forces, um, the consolidation of forces had no longer been uh, in, 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 the say, in control. There was no single uh, power to control it. Uh, most of them um, had abandoned their posts. Kabul was a city uh, that was not ready for that kind of fighting. It was a city and its security forces could do crimes, but they weren't uh, ready to fight uh, uh, against the Taliban in a battle in, in that. So uh, we, we saw the police and many other forces uh, abandoning their posts and, and not turning up to work that day. Uh, but what happened at 2.30 was that I got the news that two helicopters, one that was part of the president's fleet, was hijacked by a rogue ANDSF uh, element, and then another was shot. Uh, yes, an another was shot. Another helicopter that was supposed to go and pick up the um, uh, uh, the minister of defense was shot. Uh, and based on what had happened uh, the, the the week before, um, um, another and in, in when Herat fell. Uh, the leadership that was present there, including Ismail Khan and the deputy chief, um, uh, the, the deputy mm. minister of interior, were not allowed to fly by ANDSF uh, to evacuate to Bamiyan. Uh, I understood that th this is the end, that even the airport is no longer secure for, uh, for the Afghan president or anyone else around, and the fight is now going to be inside the city. Uh, and that was the time when I have made that decision. Uh, obviously, uh, it is difficult for, for people who don't know the context to be able to understand you know, what, uh, what transpired. Uh, but we had taken every step possible to see whether there was the possibility of um, resistance outside of Kabul, even if it, mm -hmm. it came down to it. Uh, and all of those possibilities were eliminated, uh, uh, and, and that was the only thing left that the president could do uh, to save um, lives and to ensure that, uh, that there were still uh, 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 American troops left to be able to secure because they were in the right. negotiations. It wasn't the Afghans that were negotiating anymore. So you, at 2.30, you walk up to President Ghani and you say what? I tell him it's time to leave, sir. Why? Because there was no other decision left for him to do. Right. What do you think would have happened if you'd stayed? Well, fighting would have ensued. We had two, we had two weeks. We could have continued fighting inside Kabul, uh, destroy most of the city, uh, and Who would have been thousands fighting, of though? people. You're describing forces melting away. Forces, well, whatever forces were left. We so we did this in Helmand, for example. Uh, for two weeks, a very small area was under uh, Afghan government control, and the forces fought bravely. We had a few special forces uh, fighting, and they were, they were provided with air cover, both by the Americans and our air force. Uh, and they were all able to hold for two weeks, but what transpired was that Helmand turned into the kind of uh, pictures you would see from coming out of Aleppo. Uh, thousands uh, of families were displaced from Lashkarga. Uh, some went to Kandahar, most came to Kabul. Uh, uh, we, in the end, had to then uh, make a deal to, uh, to evacuate the forces that were there. So, so that, this would have been a repeat of Helmand in, Kand in Kabul, but on a much larger scale, because here, uh, you know, this is a city of five million people. Right. Uh, and, and now even more crowded because of all the refugees, uh, internally displaced people that had come from other parts of the country um, out of war. But you know you are harshly criticized, as is President Ghani, for choosing to flee that day. 
we had to make a decision that was right for Afghanistan. What did you take with you on that plane? You know there's been allegations of corruption and that mm -hmm. money was taken. Look, those are allegations that are people know no person with the right mind would believe. Uh, the decision to leave was a very last-minute decision. Uh, in other, uh, other president's trips, there would be a lot more resources that, that would support a trip. We didn't even carry anything like that because this wasn't... You this didn't wasn't, take cash with you? Absolutely not, no. What did you take with you? We didn't. We just took ourselves. Most of the people that came on that flight ended up having to, you know, having didn't even have another a change of clothes. So um, uh, in, in in Uzbekistan and in the Emirates, even for the president, we had to buy him a change of clothes in uh, in Termiz, uh, which is where you went next. You, which is where we yeah. You took helicopters from the presidential palace to another country, to Uzbekistan, to Uzbekistan, to flee. To Termiz. There's reports that you had to fly at low altitude because you were trying to avoid the Americans knowing Absolutely. that you were fleeing. Why? Trust was gone. There was no trust. What did you think the Americans were going to do? Well, look, you know, for those of us that were there and present, uh, I had asked the Americans for something simple the day before. Uh, and it was a test to say, if this deal doesn't work out, I was working, negotiating a deal that would have a, a transfer of power to the Taliban. Uh, and if this didn't work, would we be rescued? Uh, and the response was non-committal. You, you asked know, the United States to help I you did. evacuate from if, Afghanistan. If the, this deal didn't work, would that be the case? There were intelligence reports both from Afghan sources, the Americans, and, uh, and independent that the plan for, uh, by, not by the Taliban, their sponsors, was they wanted Ashraf Ghani's head. And it's in, embarrassing enough to have lost our country. We're not going to lose another president and be embarrassed uh, uh, like that in Afghanistan and be killed. There, was, there were all precautions made. What we tried to do uh, was to see if there was anywhere that the president could go and resist and continue to be in Afghanistan. But the, the, that was no longer possible. We, we had host in mind to be able to go and continue from there. But the forces there had already melted away and there was no possibility of him going anywhere. And the, about, uh, uh, on the 12th, I, I consulted with the Minister of Defense, the Minister of Interior, and um, the uh, Chief of NDS, um, the, our National Director of Security. And, and we evaluated where there was a possibility to do any kind of resistance in another province. Mm -hmm. We considered Panjshir as well, and the Minister of Defense was clear that it is not going to be possible to do that. There was no now, safe place in Afghanistan there was no for the safe president place. to be? Absolute, unless he wanted the war to continue, unless we wanted to see a civil war return. I grew up at a time when, Af when Kabul was under civil war, when there was power factions uh, uh, trying to control uh, and they didn't, and, and millions of Kabulis uh, were mm -hmm. displaced. I know the misery they lived under in, in Peshawar, where I was, mm -hmm. the, um, and how derogatory uh, uh, terms were used to, to call us all, the refugees. We were not going to bring that back on the Afghan people. And what was being discussed in Doha was nothing less than a surrender. And if it is a surrender, why take two more weeks and risk the lives of millions of Afghans and, and then in the end do exactly the same thing anyway. But, but you know that the argument is now that had you had a peaceful transfer of power instead of the Taliban taking it by force, that we wouldn't have children starving to death in Afghanistan right now because money would have still poured in to this new government even though the Taliban was part of it. That international aid organizations would be able to provide food uh, oxygen in hospitals. What is stopping that from now, from happening now? United States and the world having sanctions on the Taliban. Well, why? I, the question is, if we were to give the Taliban exactly what they wanted, then, you know, the legitimacy given by the president by, for a surrender, you know, this is not an argument. This doesn't make sense to me well, in any way. Well, this is what the Biden administration would argue, and many Afghans, that there was a very narrow sort of window of opportunity where in those final weeks, President Ghani could have negotiated an exit that would have avoided the situation and the chaos that ensued. Was there a deal on the table 
There was no deal on the table. This is an excuse. Look, this is what Secretary was, Blinken was, on this program said it was there, that he spoke to President Ghani on, on August the 14th. He thought he had a deal, and the next day, Ghani fled. That's what I he was, says. I was closely involved in that negotiation. Uh, and, you know, in fact, you know, I, I, I worked out the terms with the Americans on what would be uh, you know, that peaceful transfer of power. It was not going to happen on August 15. It was going to happen when we still had uh, multiple provinces under Afghan control and we still had a consolidated force. The Taliban that day were all over the city. And we didn't have, like I said, a consolidated force to keep the order. And the Taliban statement was conditional. It was, you, the government is responsible for order in the city, and the people who were breaking the order were also the Taliban. Mm -hmm. And them sitting in Doha knew the time is ticking. Two weeks more, two more weeks, and the, the, and, and, and the Americans are out. They could do whatever they wanted to do. The language used by the Americans now for the government, formation of the government, was no longer inclusive. It was non-monopoly. The word non-monopoly. And you take what you want to uh, from that, but that basically means a surrender to the Taliban. Mm -hmm. And maybe the Taliban could include one or two people, and there was no specifications of it. What is stopping that from happening now? What was stopping that from happening two weeks before or August 15, whenever was um, uh, the deal was, when the Afghan government was not there to negotiate mm -hmm. that? And, the, and our partner for negotiation was the United States. The Taliban hadn't even agreed to, to meet with our team. You, it's been reported you received a text message from one of the Taliban leaders that day on August 15th. Correct. One of the Haqqanis. What did he say? What did he propose? Surrender. He said, you issue a, a statement of surrender and then we negotiate. I told him that's not how it works. You negotiate first, and then we will see what the outcome of that negotiation Did is. Did the U.S. Take tell the you to take that meeting? No. This, I, I contacted uh, uh, at the time um, Tom West, and I told him that I had received a call. We were discussing uh, at, the, at the time negotiations whether we go to Doha uh, and do this negotiations. And I said, well, there could be this opportunity. Should we do this negotiation internally? I could take it. And he said um, he consulted and called me back and said, no, don't take that meeting. You know, they, they, they couldn't trust that that was in good faith. How many people made it onto these helicopters when you fled the palace? Well, whoever was left at the palace, the, the palace grounds had vacated um, had, uh, had by most people that were working there. Uh, and on the day, not even physically, some people even left the security coordination group that we had at the NSC. Um, and they left the WhatsApp groups uh, as well. So whoever was left and we thought was still present on the palace grounds um, uh, vacated with us. There were about 11 people, and then the rest were security. Some were left behind uh, because Your of secretary the, was uh, left yes, behind. Yes, including. Uh, some were left behind because there was no room on the helicopters. Uh, and it was a hot day, and they, it could only take a, a certain amount of load. Uh, and so the number of people were exceeding what the helicopter's capacity was. So one of them, uh, one of the helicopters had to uh, you know, uh, uh, be disembarked by some people, including my personal security and my secretary. You know, the Biden and Trump administration's envoy to the Taliban, Zalmay Khalilzad, the former ambassador who was on this program recently, um, said the U.S. should have pressed President Ghani harder to make concessions so that there was a peaceful transfer of power. He told my colleague, Michael Morrell, that Ghani insisted until the very end he would not leave until a successor was decided in an election. It was late, and Ghani was making demands as if he had won the war rather than he was losing the war. What he's describing is, is delusion. Mm -hmm. You were his national security advisor. Did you ever say to him, Mr. President, the Taliban's coming to power, whether we like it or not. We have to take a negotiated deal. Look, we, until the last day, uh, and the day before, even the day before when the decision was made that a team uh, from the Republic would go and negotiate with the Taliban. There were two things that Dr. Abdullah, who was leading the peace efforts, and 
former President Karzai asked President Ghani to, uh, to get the Americans to guarantee. One, what, that the Taliban would talk to this negotiating team, mm -hmm. this team, and agree to a power sharing or uh, an inclusive government, that a negotiation would actually take place. And, and that you know, until that negotiating negotiation is complete, the Taliban are not to enter Kabul. I think the distance between the republic, not the president alone, the distance between the republic and the Taliban was great. The Taliban wanted every, they wanted the return of their Islamic emirate and uh, wanted the republic gone completely. And then the republic wanted to include the Taliban uh, as part of uh, its big circle. And, and that was the, the stand that President Ghani was representing. Yes, he wanted elections because he felt that that would be the way he hands over power. But he's not wrong to think that. He was being, he was being assured in every meeting, on every statement, that the international community wants to see a democratic Afghanistan, a sovereign Afghanistan, an Afghanistan that's at peace with itself and its neighbors. So we had these four things to look forward to. In the this United statement States was, says President Ghani just wanted to stay in power. Well, and that's it. Well, he didn't want to negotiate this his exit. Was never, this was never cleared. If the, if the United States or any other power came and said that we would like to see, we are happy to see a Taliban government, uh, and you know, the rest of it could work with, it, with that, that conversation never happened. Okay. There was never an open, honest conversation with the Afghan government in which these uh, um, uh, clarity that this level of clarity that came in after post uh, uh, um, uh, collapse never was a was a place. There wasn't a, 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 a U.S. Secretary of State or a National Security Advisor, anyone higher that has come to Afghanistan, spent a day or two. This is a mission in which we have both shed blood together, made tremendous amount of sacrifices and is worthy of protection to, to spend a day or two talk with the president and key leaders in Afghanistan to say, here is what the Americans want to do, right? You're right, we didn't read the writing on the wall. The writing on the wall was that a withdrawal will take place no matter what. We thought that the preservation of the last 20 years, the, the last two decades, mattered. And that is where we, 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 we misunderstood. Had that discussion been taken place to say the United States no longer can afford, and it would have been totally understandable, can no longer afford uh, to stay in Afghanistan and wishes to cut a deal, and we would like you to come on board, then we would have been able to make a sensible decision about what the future was, not the way it was. President Ghani wrote to President Trump and told him if this negotiation, what Zalmay Khalilzad was leading, mm -hmm. is about a withdrawal, would negotiate with us. That would give us a fighting chance, when President, not with when, the Taliban. When President Biden announced in April that he was going to pull out U.S. troops by September, you know, he pulled that back a bit, but just a few weeks, your government said you respected the decision. Well, What was what your real it, reaction? It wasn't a decision we were consulted about. It's How what, much we, what did would you a get? government respond to say uh, at that time? We still wanted to see uh, American support, uh, and it, it was important that we keep that going. Right. How much advance notice did you get from the Biden administration before the president announced on television that he was withdrawing? Maybe a few hours. A few hours. Yes. Who told you? The decision was announced. I, I, I don't exactly remember who called, uh, but we were informed just a few hours. I think Secretary Blinken called and talked to the president. And supposedly the decision would have been, uh, announcement would have been a bit later, but as is in Washington, once a decision is made, it leaks to the press very, very quickly. So uh, a few hours after we were informed, it was already in the media. For... The Biden administration, they argue, it is, they were clear throughout. They accepted the Trump administration's negotiated deal with the Taliban. The president ran on a platform of pulling back. How did you miss that writing on the wall? This was a campaign promise from President Biden. Well, this was also a campaign promise by, by, by Trump. You know, this was not, 
you withdraw, the withdrawing from Afghanistan is not what we had an issue with. And we still, I still think that it could be, uh, it, it could have had other result. I wish that things were done differently. The timing was of extreme, uh, of extreme importance. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the resources left behind were important. So the decision, uh, I think, made in April, we respected it and we thought, you know, there would be other uh, uh, enablers that would support, for example, the contractors. Contractors were critical to the survival of the ANDSF. These are Americans or other workers who were helping, basically, Correct. to, to they service. Were, they were providing fuel, they were providing ammunition, they were providing, uh, in, in some cases, food supplies uh, and uniforms. You know, a whole lot that the the the, uh, the security forces needed, uh, even the software that was being managed to pay the Afghan security forces was run by a, by a contracting company. And this all starts disappearing. So all of April. this is to be withdrawn, and then the panic that ensued is because of this. The the, the panic in the Afghan security forces at the point when they stopped fighting is they were they were. Some that were not getting paid in time. There were others who didn't have all the right ammunition and fuel. And it started to panic that this is... And then the Taliban obviously used this as an opportunity to, um, uh, to, to do enough propaganda uh, mm -hmm. uh, to their advantage. Well, you know, there's a lot of criticism of the Ghani government. And how you handled this, either not persuading the administration to change their mind or to change how they carried it out. President Ghani himself has been described as sort of living in a bubble, reading books on the grounds of the palace while the country is disintegrating. I think, you know, everyone, including myself, um, have our own problems. That doesn't mean uh, that a government collapses uh, and it doesn't come down to one person. This was not a mission. Uh, but that was, was he out of touch with reality of, on the ground? That was, it was not a mission that was President Ghani alone. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a republic, we had a parliament, we had members, uh, you know, government uh, that, that had a lot of stake in, in other leaders in Afghanistan. Uh, we had media, civil society. Everyone played a role in keeping and preserving the, uh, the Afghan government. Uh, and it, when it came down to it, is, uh, is the dependency that we had on the international security uh, presence, one, but the enablers and the financial support for them uh, more, more so. And so, um, you know, I, 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 I've never read and I would never believe that just because President Ghani read books led to the collapse of the state. No, yeah. but the I don't, criticism I think that's, that, that that's a lame was... excuse, whoever presented it, presents it. But the criticism is that he was out of touch with reality, that he was living in a bubble, that there was uh, corruption and ineptness within the government. You're the national security advisor. You're the one who gives them the hard news we have to go. Did you ever give him the hard news, Mr. President, we have to agree to negotiate our exit here because the Americans are gone. They're leaving us. Okay. Let me tell you that, you know, President Ghani received hard news every second of the day. Afghanistan was at war. Every minute we lost an Afghan across the country. There was no good news. I have never gone to President Ghani and told him, here is some good news, or the, for that matter, anyone else to, uh, to issue him good news. It was just bad news all along. We were a country at war. Uh, when, you, and when you came here to the United States in June, this is just months before the pullout, you went to the White House. You went to the CIA. It was front page news in American newspapers that the U.S. intelligence assessment was that the government could collapse within six months. Did the United States government ever tell you that to your face? Well, we received some uh, of this information. Um, and I remember uh, a security beep briefing uh, about three or four weeks before the collapse, or perhaps even less than that, uh, in which there was a timeline. Uh, and I, I asked what it meant, and it said that that is where we, in, we, we believe that the end, you know, Taliban would enter Kabul. It, wasn't, it was vague, it was not a very clear response whether they believed that, that that would be the fall of Kabul or that would be the time when the Taliban surround Kabul. Uh, but there was also a lot of belief that, you know, the Afghan security forces would, would be able to defend Kabul mm -hmm. for some time. 
uh, it, it, it wasn't anticipated how quickly the morale fell, and once the morale of the security forces was gone, um, you know, they, they were not ready to fight a battle that they were they were knew were going they were going to lose. Did you ever ask what happens if this diplomatic effort fails? Well. Uh, this was a big part of the, the whole discussion when the president came uh, to Washington. Uh, it was about whether the Afghan government will continue to, to have support, uh, whether the Afghan government and the Afghan security forces will continue to have their support. And we, we were assured was the Afghan government uh, will continue to receive the security assistance that is, uh, it, the ANDSF will continue to receive some additional equipment mm -hmm. that, it, uh, that uh, was previously promised. Um, and that they're working on, uh, on over-the-horizon support for ANDSF uh, for maintenance and other needs of, uh, um, uh, 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 that were previously being done this is through what the Kabul. the CIA director and the president of the United States are telling you. Well, this is a discussion overall. Uh, I think this is, uh, uh, you know, the specifics of each discussion varied. Uh, with, of course, the intelligence, the discussion was about threats and what, they, what, what uh, level of threats would be emanating if there was a, a, a total Taliban victory and what, what it is that they would want it to see. I, I think, um, you know, overall, the discussion was about the Afghan government will continue to have uh, the support of mm -hmm. the United States. Uh, going forward, and we hoped that uh, a peace settlement would happen before the U.S. withdraws, but it was not certain that that is what will happen. Right now, um, there is, as we talked about, no money flowing in to Afghanistan because the Taliban are now running the government. Do you think, if you had stayed, that it would have made a difference? No. If the condition was that a Taliban government be in place, there would have been a Taliban government in place just two weeks later. So you don't feel a sense of responsibility when you hear about what the UN is saying, that this is going to be a bleak winter of starvation? Absolutely. Well, of course I feel responsible. I feel responsible now and I feel responsible then. I think what, what the outcome is, is unfair to the Afghan people. Right? A decision was made to include and be able to have to see the Taliban in government, right? And, the and States, then the Biden administration uh, agreed when, to what the Trump administration agreed to, which was the Taliban's coming back into power. When that decision was made, I think it was important to make uh, assumptions about how there will be collaboration with with that government in place, and how we are going to deliver aid to people that are in need without, if there is a time where there is no direct cooperation with them. I think there was, there was a chance to do that when uh, uh, and I have never seen any insurgency with whom ministers, foreign ministers have met. And the Taliban themselves told me when we were negotiating uh, or were trying to negotiate directly to say that they have foreign ministers lined up waiting to meet with them. There is no need for them to talk to the Afghan government. They considered themselves in 2019 a government in waiting. Right? Because and the United States and if had that signed that was a deal the case, with them. And that was the case if they were a government in waiting in 2019 and the international community met with them every day. There was a meeting with the Taliban, advertised, no secret meetings, advertised meetings, public meetings with the Taliban. You know, it would have been important to discuss how this aid be delivered back then. Uh, and, and now I think it's also important that, you know, whatever has happened, it's still important that we reach uh, to those people in need and find ways, be creative about how do we how we support the Afghan public. They are the ones that are suffering now. Are you saying you believe the United States is responsible for the Taliban's return to power? I think, you know, things could have been done differently. Uh, I wish things were done differently. There could have been a, a, a different outcome to this process had Ambassador Khalizad decided to uh, bring the Afghan government into confidence and, and be transparent about the negotiating negotiations process. Uh, I think we would have seen a different Afghanistan today than we, what we are witnessing right now. 
What about the Taliban's ties with Al Qaeda? Do you believe that Afghanistan will once again become a harbor and well, haven for terrorists? I have been on the record that there is no uh, uh, distinction between the Taliban. I think the international community and many uh, uh, distinguish between uh, terrorist groups in silos, as if Al Qaeda is separate to Daesh or Taliban. I, I believe they're all part of the integral network, and they all uh, um, uh, attract from the same pool. And they believe in the same uh, in the same ideologies and outcome. It may have different political structures, but it is all the same. We have seen time and again proof that an attack conducted by ISIS uh, was actually facilitated by the Haqqani network. So uh, the distinction between Al Qaeda, Taliban, and ISIS is very difficult in an environment like that. And Al Qaeda, particularly with the Taliban, has been so close, they have intermarried. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be impossible to separate Al Qaeda from Taliban. So, should all the billions of dollars in money that is being frozen right now be released into? use in Afghanistan? How do you do that without putting money in the hands of the Taliban and al-Qaeda? Well, I think that's where we have to be very creative, creative about how, how money is flown uh, into the hands of the Afghan people, uh, not the Taliban. They, it would be impossible that the Taliban benefit and not benefit from some of that. I think I've already seen the Taliban using uh, aid given by NGOs to people as propaganda as if it was coming from them. So whether it's WFP or uh, any well, other agency mm -hmm. that provides that aid um, uh, to the Afghan people that the Taliban would not try to use it to further strengthen their hand in Afghanistan. Uh, um, uh, but, they, but there must be ways where we don't do that physically. And you want to work on that issue now? Well, I'm trying to assist in any, any way I can for my people, at least to raise awareness about what needs to be done um, and whatever we can to help our people. What do you think your biggest mistake was? I think, you know, not seeing that writing on the wall about the withdrawal probably is one of the biggest. Uh, we should have understood that the United States and uh, has made its decision and and would withdraw under any circumstances. Uh, and I think that probably uh, is one of the you know, one of the reasons we weren't able to uh, secure another outcome. You felt that you were going to have the United States change its mind based on conditions no. on the ground? No, I felt I felt that our partners, the United States the United States included, believed in a democratic Afghanistan, a place where we were going to preserve the gains of the last 20 years. I thought those gains meant something. Amdala Mahib, thank you for your time today. Thank you for having me.